This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. My name is Jahan Fahimi. Um, thanks for having me tonight. Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to talk about, as Jeff said, medical decision making. Um, specifically, I'm going to give it to you from my perspective, which is in the emergency department. Um, I'm going to give you my full disclosure here. There will be no references to the TV show House. Um, in fact, there'll be no references to any television show that involves um, the medical profession. I don't watch any of them. I don't think that any of them are accurate. So, um, but what we will talk about is, you know, what do these two people have in common? A physician and a professional poker player. And we'll ask and answer, hopefully, what do these two people have in common? You know, the police officer and your local physician. So to get started, I thought I would give you kind of the paradigm that is taught in medical school. Um, this is the, the paradigm that we use in order to teach medical students how to become a diagnostician. Um, it's a, a little bit of a simplification of the, the scheme is, and to be a master diagnostician, there's some nuances to this. So, but let me just kind of go over the basics first. You know, when you approach a patient, an undifferentiated patient with a particular complaint, and you don't know what's, what's ailing them, you start off with the history. History is usually a, a brief, one-line chief complaint. I'm here for chest pain. Um, and then you dive into what we call the history of present illness. Tell me everything you can possibly tell me about this chest pain. When did it start? How bad is it? Where does it go? What's associated with it? Every possible detail. Um, and then from there, you know, I may ask about your past medical history. I may ask you about your medications. I may ask you about your family history. Anyone in your family have a heart attack or anything like that? I may ask you about your social history. Do you drink? Do you smoke? Where do you live? What do you do for a living? Maybe even like a sexual history. Um, and then I'll dive into this laundry list of questions. Do you have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain? And I'll just go through a whole laundry list of, of questions and really try and get as much history from you as I possibly can. From then, I move on to the physical examination, and this can range from a head to toe, nook and cranny, I look everywhere on you, listen to every part of your body, um, to a very targeted, focused exam, depending on what the complaint may be. I then combine those two things, and I come up with what we call the differential diagnosis. The differential diagnosis essentially is just a, almost like a to-do list, if you will, of all the potential things that I'm considering that might be wrong with you. Based on that differential diagnosis list, I'm then gonna order some tests. I'm gonna apply some tests to you to get more information and hopefully make a final diagnosis, right? So while this sounds nice and logical and almost very deterministic, it's really not. There's a lot of nuances to this. You know, what part of the history is the most important? You know, if I don't know what's wrong with you, do I know the right questions to ask you in the first place? Um, you know, do all physicians have the same skills to find all the same physical exam um, findings in a, in a patient? Does your complaint even manifest itself physically in a way that I can detect? Um, and then, you know, when it comes to assimilating those two pieces of information, the history and the physical, you know, what do I put in the differential diagnosis? You know, should I consider every possible condition? Do I have to narrow it down? Can I reasonably even think of everything? Do I know enough to put on that differential diagnosis? So before we kind of dive into the nitty gritty of those and, and then diagnostic tests and coming up with a final diagnosis, I thought this would be like a nice point to do like a little history lesson. Um, I really like kind of history of medicine and this is probably the world's foremost diagnostician, um, at least historically speaking. 
Um, Sir William Osler is this Canadian-born physician. He was one of the founding fathers of uh, Johns Hopkins University. He pretty much invented the discipline of medical training. He was the first doctor to take medical students out of the classroom and say, nope, you're going to come to the bedside and you're going to learn how to take care of patients in real time. Um, he's been called the father of modern medicine. Um, he was a physician, a historian, an author, and apparently a really renowned practical joker. Um, when he was a child, apparently, he took all the desks in his single room um, schoolhouse and put them all in the attic. Um, and then he guessed he rounded up like a gaggle of geese and released them in the school. So he got expelled from that school and he went to some boarding school in Ontario. And then there he locked like the headmistress in a, in a room and then lit, um, I think it was mustard, um, molasses and pepper and then wafted the smoke into the room almost as asphyxiating a janitor. So he was briefly jailed for this. Um, his uh, brother, who then later on went on to have this like brilliant criminal law um, career, actually persuaded them to drop the charges, um, fortunately for us. Um, he went on to, um, from McGill to University of Pennsylvania and then settled in at Johns Hopkins where he sort of became this famous physician. And these are actual photos. Um, if you go on to um, McGill's website, they have all these beautiful photos of him. And this is Osler at the bedside taking a history and then really examining the patient and then really deliberating. Um, and what he was really good at is coming up with these wonderful quotes and he would say things like, listen to your patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. And then he would say other things like, observe, record, tabulate, communicate, use your five senses, learn to see, learn to hear, learn to feel, learn to smell, and know that by practice alone you can become expert. And what he's really getting at here um, is two things. One, it's, the, it's sort of the art of taking a history, the art of a physical examination. Um, it can be taught to a certain extent, but it has to be sort of practiced and vetted and refined. You know, when I learned how to listen to somebody's heart in medical school, I thought, well, okay, yeah, I, okay, I think I hear it. And then the next patient I went and listened to, I thought, well, this is what I think I hear, and I presented to my resident and my attending, and then they listened and kind of put me in check, re, you know, revised my understanding of what I was hearing. And it's this iterative process that, that you sort of learn to hone these skills. Um, and it's just like any other skill. If you don't practice them, you will lose them. So um, we can see that, um, you know, that these are sort of the, the, the principles that are being taught um, to, medical, to, to medical students and then residents and, and, and practiced among physicians. Um, and you know, to, so I, I'd like to get, sort of give you this example of how this progression occurs. Um, I recently, and this is a real case, I had a, I had a case of a 25-year-old woman who came in with um, fevers and chills. And um, the resident, fairly junior resident, actually an intern, saw the patient and he amassed a whole bunch of information. You know, he did all the sort of observing and, and recording and tabulating that we're talking about and said, well, she has a fever. I think that it's probably some sort of infection. You know, young women tend to get kidney infections. Maybe she seems a little bit confused or delirious. I think that maybe she could have meningitis. And these are, you know, very reasonable, reasonable um, considerations. But then, you know, I went to the bedside um, and actually through the help of with, with another colleague of mine and we spent a little bit more time and, and took a little bit more detailed history and there was other nuanced findings. Um, you know, I noticed that her pupils were a little bit larger than, than normal and I kind of honed in on the, the, um, the medications that she was on and my colleague picked up on the fact that these weren't so much chills as they were muscle tightening and twitching. Um, and, and he actually appropriately asked the boyfriend, you know, does she take any other supplements, anything else? And, and lo and behold, she'd been taking an antidepressant as prescribed and a supplement that was over the counter that had interacted and given her a fatal syndrome called serotonin syndrome. Um, she didn't die, she did okay, she actually lived. Um, but it's just sort of to, to, to give you an example of how, you know, you, you learn these skills and you amass them and you come up with, with um, you take, by, by taking the history and the physical, you come up with a differential diagnosis. And that it's an iterative process that you get better at. And with every level of training, you sort of add to it and hopefully get better. So with that, let me sort of spend a little bit of time discussing the specifics of the differential diagnosis, or what we like to call the differential. 
Um, it's really, the definition is multiple sort of p potential candidate diagnostic considerations that we're going to, you know, put on this list of, of possibilities. Um, and what we do a lot of times is this process of elimination. I have this long list and I'm going to try and eliminate them one at a time until one is left or I, you know, figure out a way to confirm one of my considerations. But let's say we sort of get an, ex we can get a, an exhaustive history and perform a perfect physical examination that still doesn't tell us what goes into the differential diagnosis. Um, like for example, does every patient with a fever, do I have to consider serotonin syndrome? And this gets at this sort of adage in medicine, you know, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, right? And so, you know, that's, that's really to say that common things are in fact common and you, that's what we should be focusing in on. But at the same time, zebras exist. So what do we, what do we kind of do? How do we consider all these different diagnoses? And this is where we're gonna kind of start getting into the, a little bit of the nitty gritty of, of the cognitive aspects of decision making. And specifically, we're gonna compare and contrast heuristics and analytic reasoning. Heuristics are basically like rules of thumb. Um, you can consider them shortcuts, you can consider them experience, you can consider them intuition, pattern recognition. It really just allows us to make you know, decisions without very much cognitive, in, um, cognitive energy. It doesn't take very much for me to sort of recognize a pattern and say, you know, this is what I think it is. Um, it's extremely important. It's surprisingly accurate and um, it's very, very efficient, especially when you're working in a busy emergency department and you're, you have lots of input coming at you at once. Um, it allows me, for example, to commit to memory very specific EKG findings that are associated with a heart attack and then look at a patient who's complaining of chest pain, put those two together and say, it's a heart attack, I'm done. I don't really have to expend very much energy in coming up with that diagnosis. Um, I know, for example, that when a patient comes to the ER with face, arm and leg weakness and has some slurred speech on, and, and the weakness is on the left side, that they're having a stroke. And I know even more specifically that it's a stroke involving the right middle cerebral artery. It's just pattern recognition. It's not very complicated. Um, so um, it also allows me to, to sort of have these rules of thumb that I apply, whether they're right or wrong. When I see like an elderly patient who um, like let's say an elderly woman who feels weak and dizzy and can't really provide me with any additional history beyond, I just feel weak and dizzy. It allows me to apply this kind of rule of thumb. Well, it's probably a urinary tract infection because a lot of little old ladies get urinary tract infections and they just feel off. And you know what, I might be wrong, but a lot of times I'm right. So um, that's how I kind of apply heuristics. They can, um, they can even be applied to making you know, very rare diagnoses. If the constellation of symptoms are really classic, you know, it's about pattern recognition. It's about having learned it in medical school and then applying it at the bedside. Um, so this pattern recognition is, is sort of very intuitive. We do it all the time. You'd probably be surprised at how often your doctors are doing this kind of in the background when they tell you a diagnosis or they, they give you an answer. They're not really thinking about it. It's just pattern recognition. And that's contrasted with analytic reasoning. And this is, you know, you could say maybe when heuristics fail, when they fail to converge on a particular diagnosis, I really have to sort of start thinking a little bit more. Um, and this is, you know, um, it, it's not to say that this is, this is a rare um, cognitive process. It's actually very common. I, you know, in the ER, I'm stumped all the time. I see things that I've never seen before. And I have to stop and think, well, okay, I, I didn't converge on a particular diagnosis based on my heuristics, so let's start applying some analytic reasoning. And, and this is where you sort of reach back in the depths of your memory and you sort of recall information. Um, I think back to medical school. I think back to studying for my board exams. Um, you, you sort of sprinkle in a little bit of your, your experience, um, your sort of understanding of biology and chemistry and maybe sort of extrapolate. Well, I know that this can happen, could it be happening in, in this patient? Or I think to myself, I once had a patient that had this syndrome, you know, what were the features that between that case and this case that are similar? Can I, can I explain this patient's symptoms by something that I've seen in the past? Um, 
And so this really does depend a lot on fund of knowledge. You actually have to know a lot in order for this to work. You can't make a diagnosis you don't think of. Um, and experience, like I said, plays a, plays a huge role. So um, the reality is, you know, it's really not heuristics versus analytic reasoning, but it's, it's more that, you know, a good physician will kind of supplement their heuristic thought processes with detailed analytic um, reasoning to, to safeguard against potentially missing something, right? So, you know, if, if I look at someone and I say, aha, I know what you have, I'll temper that and I'll say, mm, let me stop and think. What else could be causing this constellation of symptoms? And that's sort of what you would expect, hopefully, from your sort of humble diagnostician to avoid what we in the medical profession cause, call um, premature closure. So um, let's talk about heuristics and analytic reasoning like an actual practice, right? So the instant I see a patient and the instant the patient tells me what's wrong with them, my mind's trying sort of to, to match them with some, some pattern recognition, some, some intuition about what's, what's causing their problem. So I have a young woman with abdominal pain. I apply some heuristic principles. I specifically say to myself, I better get a pregnancy test because all young women are pregnant until proven otherwise. That served me, <laughs> that served me very, very well. I mean, it's, this is just, I don't think about it. I just do it, right? And then I start taking a little bit more history and you know, the, the patient feeds me information and I start thinking about other differential diagnoses. And, and we, this sort of goes back to the history and physical exam stuff. It's not so much that I take a history and then stop and think about it. It's that the patient tells me, you know, I've got abdominal pain and it began right after I ate. So my mind's already moving. I'm already saying abdominal pain after eating, that reminds me of peptic ulcer disease or it reminds me of gallbladder disease. And then I'll ask them, or I'll, I'll elicit more history and they'll, you know, about the, the radiation and the timing of the pain and the, the quality of the pain. And I'm constantly revising. Well, that doesn't quite sound like gallbladder disease. Maybe it sounds more like a kidney stone. And, and it's the sort of real-time iterative process that I'm just trying to fit patterns. Um, and then um, I may ask pointed questions like, you know, do you have flank pain? Or do you have back pain? Have you had any fevers? And if the answer is no, well, then I've sort of used my heuristic reasoning to sort of say, well, you know, it's, not a, it's probably not a, a kidney infection because you should have some flank pain or some back pain. This is not very complicated reasoning. This is just pattern recognition. I have a list of things that I sort of run through in any patient that has um, abdominal pain, and I'm ruling in and ruling out rapidly as I'm taking the history. And then I do the same thing when I do the physical exam. I try and revise those. And so I'm just constantly basically taking past experiences, recalling events, thinking about previous patterns. I take this history and physical, and I go round and round and round. And hopefully at the end, what I'm left with is a sort of nice, nuanced, well-reasoned differential diagnosis, right? Um, and it turns out that this approach is actually pretty successful. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. It gets us a, a great majority of the way there. Um, and uh, to sort of talk about these principles a little, in a little bit more detail, I'm going to sort of take another little detour and um, talk about a, a colleague of mine, um, Harrison Alter, who um, actually, if you've seen the Waiting Room documentary, is, is briefly in that documentary. He works with me over in, in Oakland. Um, and he was actually the focus or a, a case study in the Jerome Groupman book, um, How Doctors Think, if anyone's ever read that. If you haven't read it, you should pick it up. It's a, it's a fantastic book. Um, and so Harrison, in that book, um, and with his permission, he, he's going to let me sort of relay the stories that, that were in that book. Um, he tells the story of a young boy that he saw with back pain and a middle-aged woman with uh, difficulty uh, breathing. So the young boy with back pain. So this boy was at school. Um, another kid jumps on his back, and he immediately has horrible back pain. And he's brought in on a backboard and with a C collar and um, is immobilized, and Harrison evaluates him. Um, he examines him and finds that the child has very specific focal tenderness in his mid-back. And so he says, you know, I'm going to get an x-ray. He orders an x-ray and it comes back and it shows that there's what we call a compression wedge fracture at the T10 vertebrae in the thoracic 
um, spine. This is a type of fracture that's actually quite common in 80-year-old osteoporotic women, not in 10-year-old young, healthy uh, boys. So he thinks to himself, that's not right. I need more information, and he orders a CT scan. And the CT scan shows that compression fracture and nothing else. And he orders blood tests and doesn't really provide any additional clarification as to why this boy has this wedge fracture. And so he says, you know what, I'm going to get an MRI. And he ships the boy off for an MRI, which basically confirms the, uh, the fracture and finds no other information. So now what does he do? Well, he calls a pediatrician because something's just not adding up. Um, pediatrician says, well, you know, we see this sometimes. And Harrison is left with, with nothing. Um, he, the, 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 his, his, in his mind, this does not fit any pattern. And this boy should not have a wedge fracture of his thoracic spine. And all uh, attempts to seek further information have sort of come up, um, come up dry. So what happens to, the, to, this, to this boy? Well, a few weeks later, he's at home when he collapses in severe debilitating pain in his back. And he comes back to the ER. Harrison happens to be working in the ER again. And, um, he gets an x-ray, and now there's four new wedge fractures of his spine. And the child gets shipped off to an orthopedic surgeon who does a biopsy and confirms a diagnosis of leukemia. Um, so Harrison was right. I mean, Harrison was right. Something did not add up, and he was left very, very uneasy, and he kept, kept going through the search. And in this case, both his heuristics and his analytic reasoning kind of failed him. He was unable to make the diagnosis until the diagnosis kind of presented itself. Now, let me contrast that with the middle-aged woman who is having some difficulty breathing. It's flu season. It's in the middle of winter. Harrison has now seen about like 10 or 15 patients in, that, in the last couple of days with you know, bronchitis, pneumonia, uh, viral syndrome. And this woman comes in and says, I've been feeling terrible. I've had this head cold, and I feel short of breath. And she's been drinking orange juice and drinking a lot of tea. Um, she's been taking some aspirin, but she feels no better whatsoever. So Harrison does his sort of detailed history physical examination. He notices that she's breathing a little bit fast. Um, her blood work shows that her white blood cell count is a little bit elevated, so a marker of inflammation. Her electrolytes are a little bit off, and the acid base status of her blood is a little bit off that's consistent with an infection. Um, he gets a chest x-ray, and he doesn't see uh, a pneumonia or anything else like that, but he says, you know, this is a subclinical or sort of early viral pneumonia. But given that, you know, you are having a little bit of trouble breathing, I'm just going to admit you to the hospital for observation. He put this woman beautifully into a nice little box based on what he'd seen in the last few days and made a diagnosis. He didn't require very much thinking. He, the, the patterns all sort of lined up. Well, his colleague, who is then seeing the patient to admit her to the hospital, comes to him shortly thereafter and says, hey, you know that lady you just admitted to me? She's got aspirin toxicity. And in reality, she'd not been taking just a little bit of aspirin for her head cold. She's been taking a lot of aspirin for her cold. And aspirin toxicity presents classically like this. Rapid breathing, feeling a little short of breath, um, the acid-base disturbances. And so Harrison thought, how could I have missed this? It's so obvious. Well, he used the context which is, with which he was in and his heuristics to make a diagnosis. And he didn't apply any analytic reasoning and kind of missed this one. Now, Harrison is, is probably one of the most um, brilliant diagnosticians I know. So this is in no way um, a knock on him. And I've used these cases with his, with his permission. So where are we going to turn to, um, turn to now? This really gets at, um, in my mind, and we're going to sort of dive into this a little bit more in a little bit more detail. Um, again, what Osler would, would say is medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. So we asked earlier, what goes into a differential diagnosis? Um, well, we kind of answered this before. You know, we, Clinicians are going to kind of consider what the most likely diagnoses are, the horses, and, you know, potentially some zebras or more dangerous things that, that you, you really don't want to, to miss. Um, it does depend somewhat on the complexity of the patient. A more complex patient with more medical problems is more likely to have uh, a, a longer list of differential diagnoses that are possible. Um, it's going to probably include more things if the case is unclear or vague or very nonspecific. 
Um, or it might include just a few things if you can really kind of narrow it down and are left with, say, one, two, three, four, five things that you want to consider most highly. And it will obviously depend a lot on context. Um, you know, let's think about a patient who presents with a rash and joint pain in California versus Connecticut. Well, in Connecticut, rash and joint pain probably means Lyme disease. In California, not so much. Or even more broadly, if you think about it globally, a child with a fever here in the United States, you know, it's probably nothing, you know, in a, in a, in a society where most children are vaccinated. But you go to Africa, and particularly in places where malaria is endemic, and a child with a fever means something very, very differently. So your context matters into how likely, what the probability is of, of a diagnosis being present and, and whether or not it, it will end up on your differential. So let's explore this further. I asked you earlier, what's the difference, or what, what do, a, sorry, not the difference, but what do a, a physician and a professional poker player have in common? And once again, I'm gonna go on a little tangent here. Um, I assume a lot of people are familiar with Texas Hold'em poker. It's become very popular in, let's say, the last decade. It's, it's televised almost as like a sport now. Um, you can watch it on ESPN. So um, let me explain the rules just so that we're all on the same page. You get dealt two cards, um, and you look at those cards, and based on what you think of those two cards, you will decide whether or not you wanna sort of join that round, and whether you wanna pay in the ante or put in a, put in a bet. You then get um, what's called the, the flop. It's three cards that go to the communal table, so all the players around the table will share those three cards, and then you'll turn over one more card called the, the turn, and then one more card called the river. And those five communal cards, all the players will share, and they'll try and make some combination based on the two in their hand and the five on the table to come up with the five best cards and beat their, their opponents, okay? So let's say you're playing Texas Hold'em poker against nine other people, um, and you get dealt this hand, and I picked this hand specifically because um, a 7-2 offsuit is probably the worst hand you could be dealt right off the bat. Um, and um, interestingly, people have figured it out exactly to the number, you know, what the probability is of winning if you get dealt this hand. So on the outset against nine different players, the chances of winning that hand are 4%, okay? So if you're foolish, you'll enter that round and you'll, you'll bet a little bit. And let's say, um, as far as the communal cards, this is what gets dealt um, for the flop. You get a king, a two, and an ace, right? Well, this is kind of good for us. We got a two. Now I have, at least I've made a pair, so we're making some progress. But there's a king and an ace. And if any of the other players has a king or an ace, they've, they're already beating me. So, you know, it becomes a little bit more difficult at this point to know what your probability of winning is. But we can actually calculate the number, and it's 8%. So you've doubled your chances of winning, but you're still kind of not in a good spot. Well, let's say, again, you're still foolish. You decide to continue to enter, or maybe you're bluffing, who knows, um, and you get dealt a seven on the turn. Well, now things have changed. I have two pair, right? So now um, I'm thinking to myself, well, what are my chances of winning? Well, now my chances have gone up to 37%, significant jump, right? Let's say we get dealt another seven, and I've made a full house off of my seven-two offsuit. Really unlikely, but let's say this happens. Um, now, what are my chances of winning? Eighty-seven percent. I try. I take those odds. I would go ahead and, and put go all in on that. So, really, what the poker player do, is doing is it's sort of taking like the the deal, the flop, the turn, the river, and it's deciding whether it wants to sort of bet and raise and fold or fold. So, let's talk about probability and and poker. So we, we briefly, or I told you what the probability is of winning when you have just this information, right? We call this a lot of times the, the prior probability or the, the, the pre-test probability or the pre-information probability of, of winning, right? And then I gave you some information. I gave you three more cards and said, I want you to estimate a posterior probability. And we said that, that in this case, it, was, it we had jumped up to 8%. Right? And so this idea of taking a probability of an event, taking in some information, and then revising the probability of that event, oftentimes in an iterative process, is what sort of underlies this, um, what we call Bayesian analysis. And Thomas Bayes 
um, from the 18th century, actually never published this, for, this famous formula for which he's most famously known. Um, it was published after his death by one of his, one of his colleagues. He was an English mathematician. Um, he was also a Presbyterian minister, I think. Um, and so what are some real world applications of Bayesian statistics? Um, if anyone has heard of Nate Silver and 538.org, he's, uh, he's a Bayes Bayesian. He basically uses Bayesian analysis. Um, and between the 2008 and 2012 elections, he correctly predicted which presidential candidate would win which state in 99 out of 100 states. He predicted who would win the senatorial races in 60, um, six out of 68 um, times. He's also predicted the winner of the NCAA basketball tournament, both in 2012 and 2013. Um, and this has been you know, applied to baseball. It's been applied to gambling, um, financial forecasting, physics, um, and then, of course, medicine and medical decision making. So let's, let's take this back to medicine and, and what we do um, in clinical practice. So Bayesian analysis in medicine. So we said that um, physicians are kind of often performing this sort of rapid iterative process when they're evaluating a patient. Um, and they're obtaining a history and physical, and they're coming up with a differential um, diagnostics, um, differential diagnosis. And in order to do that, they're applying some heuristics. They're applying some analytic um, reasoning. Um, and, um, and a lot of the analytic reasoning in that sort of early stages are, are very simple analytic reasoning. The more complex analytic reasoning comes in at this stage. So um, we have that differential diagnosis, let's say, that based on the information that was presented to us. Um, and we say, you know, how probable um, does a condition need to be in order for a physician to, to consider it? Um, and that depends largely on how dangerous the condition is um, and if the, you know, what type of physician you're, you're talking about. A very conservative physician might include a whole host of things that are even unlikely. And if you came into me and said, I have chest pain, and I thought, well, this could be a rib fracture, and there was like, say, let's say a 5% chance you had a rib fracture in my mind, I may not pursue that because there's a 95% chance you don't have it, and a rib fracture in and of itself, I'm not so worried about. But if we're talking about a heart attack, now, you know, let's say there's a 1% chance you have a heart attack, but I'm not willing to miss that, even if there's a 99% chance you don't have it, I may consider it, right? So how, how um, dangerous the condition is and how, what my risk tolerance is for, that, for the specific diagnoses will largely influence what goes into my differential diagnosis. It'll also depend on you know, the patient's risk tolerance. It'll depend on you know, how litigious is my medical community in which I'm working. How, how badly do I want to protect myself against Events getting sued, um, against you know looking bad in front of the patient and looking bad in front of my colleagues. These are all real life considerations that physicians make. So anyway, let's say I come up with a list of candidate um, diagnoses and I'm going to begin sort of my Bayesian, more complex analytic reasoning at this point. So um, let's talk about the diagnostic tests. We talked about history, physical, and um, uh, differential diagnoses. Now we're getting into the diagnostic tests. Let's say. I have, in just like the examples I just gave you, I've, I've determined a prior probability of condition A, okay? I apply a diagnostic test. Maybe that's uh, blood work, maybe it's an x-ray, maybe it's an EKG, maybe it's some other test, doesn't matter. Some test that gives me some additional information, much like the, when you get the flop in poker and you get additional information. And then I come up with a post-test or posterior probability of that condition A existing. And I'll give you an actual tangible example um, for this. Let's talk about a case of pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism um, is a potentially fatal condition where a blood clot can form somewhere in the legs, break off, travel up into the lungs, lodge itself into the lungs, and um, cause severe chest pain, respiratory distress, and sometimes death. Well, turns out um, pulmonary embolism is a great case study for this because we have, as clinicians, worked out a really good algorithm for assessing a patient's risk of having um, this pulmonary embolism, or PE as we call it, right? So let's say a patient comes to me and says, I'm having some chest pain and some shortness of breath. And I think, well, I wonder if this could be a pulmonary embolism. I apply this algorithm of sort of history and physical exam um, considerations, and I get to a prior probability based on those, that information of about 
for a fatal condition, that's pretty likely, and I do not want to be missing that. So I'm going to apply a particular test that I have at my discretion, which is a CT scan. Right? Pretty easy for me to get in the emergency department. And I arrive at a posterior probability. Well, what's my posterior probability of that PE being present? The answer is it depends. I and mean, what were the results of my CT scan? If my CT scan is positive, the likelihood that you have a PE, or the patient has a PE, is 80%. Very likely. Probably likely enough that I would begin treatment immediately. If the CT scan is negative, the, the posterior probability, the post-test probability is only 2%. So maybe I'd be willing to tolerate a 2% miss rate in this condition, um, and I might discharge the patient home without anything. So what does this, this uh, kind of schematic tell us about um, our decision making? Well, it tells us that there are almost, essentially, no perfect tests. You just saw that I gave you an example of a potentially life-threatening disease, and I applied a really good test that we have our, at our disposal, a CT scan. And I couldn't tell you with certainty, even after the CT scan, if the disease is present or not. It's because the test is not perfect. There are essentially no perfect tests. Um, and that there will almost always be some amount of uncertainty. Um, and that's the kind of ugly reality of, of medicine, is that there's a lot more uncertainty than patients, and a lot of times doctors are willing to uh, be comfortable with. Um, doctors are probably a little bit more comfortable with this, with this uncertainty, because we are just sort of more familiar with it. Now, in reality, when I have my differential diagnosis, let's say I have four conditions, I'm going to be doing this rapidly. I'm going to be doing it with multiple tests for multiple conditions simultaneously, effectively you know, kind of ruling out or ruling in conditions as I, as I go through. And sometimes I'll actually take a, a, a condition that I think might be possible. I'll apply a diagnostic test, and I'll come up with a post-test probability for that disease being present. And I'll think to myself, huh, I don't know for sure if that's, if that's enough certainty for me. And I'll apply yet another diagnostic test to try and further refine my um, probability of that disease being present. So that's kind of how we do this in, in actual practice. And I'll kind of summarize this first part of the talk with, you know, you know we, we talked about history um, and physical examination, how it's a sort of learned and taught um, skill and art in a lot of ways that's iterative and requires a lot of training and practice to get good at. Um, how to form a differential diagnosis depends on many factors, particularly how likely something is and how potentially dangerous something might be. Um, and we have to choose the probabilities at which we are willing to sort of leave things off or include things onto the differential diagnosis. And then using those probabilities, we apply diagnostic tests and hopefully come up with um, uh, a final diagnosis. And Osler actually you know, kind of alluded to this, the, this whole framework of, of the uncertainty when he said there's no disease more conducive to clinical humility than aneurysm of the aorta. I thought this was, you know, this is very relevant because this is still true. An aneurysm of the aorta, which is the main blood vessel in the abdomen, um, can sort of balloon and, and rupture and cause death is, is oftentimes a very elusive diagnosis to make. Um, and I think it, it really sort of underscores the, the limitations and humility in, in diagnosing conditions. So um, I'm going to sort of leave that framework. Um, it's kind of what I learned in medical school plus the, the nuances of how I apply that in actual practice and move on to sort of phase two of, of the talk. Um, I'm going to add on kind of a layer of complexity. You know, what if time is of the essence. What if I don't have enough time to sit down at the bedside and think through and reason and come up with a list of considerations and um, apply multiple tests one at a time and kind of see what, what comes up? Um, when seconds count, when it's a matter of, of life and death, um, I need to kind of come up with a, a different framework um, to, to approach that patient. So to, to illustrate this, I'm going to show you a series of kind of five different uh, scenarios that um, we encounter in, the, uh, in, in clinical practice, right? So um, I made this schematic. It's a, it's a, uh, a graph. Um, on the y-axis, you have illness. 
and on the x-axis you have time. Um, and I've picked an arbitrary line, and I'm going to say, you know, above that line, all is well, and below that line, things turned out poorly. So let's say that I, have, I see a patient who presents, and that's their trajectory, right? And I intervene right about there. And based on my intervention, this is the trajectory the patient takes. It might mean that I was unable to do anything. Maybe that trajectory was, was headed in that direction no matter what I did. And there was nothing I was going to do to change that. Well, alternatively, we can think, you know, let me that same patient comes in and I intervene. And I can actually affect their trajectory. Maybe this is the trajectory they'll take. Maybe I make a little bit of, of an improvement. But ultimately, I'm not going to be able to to save the day. There's a different scenario in which a patient presents. I intervene, and I actually do something reasonably good. I stabilize things. They, maybe they didn't go back to their regular level of, of health, but they're not going to have a bad outcome. And these are sort of probably what we mostly strive for. These are the little victories that we get every day. Um, there is the scenario in which a patient will present, I will intervene, and then this will happen, and that's the worst case scenario. I actually did something, presumably, to, to harm them. But what we're going to focus on is this one. Let's say a patient comes in and they're taking a rapid um, clinical course towards a bad outcome, and we intervene, and this is the outcome that we, that we get. And this is what we all kind of live for. So what does it take to be this kind of physician as opposed to all the other, other ones? Well, obviously, it takes a condition that's potentially reversible. But assuming that the condition is reversible, you know, what are the qualities of a physician that are necessary in order to make this the outcome that you end up with? You, know, you want to be able to make sort of quick, accurate assessments because, as you saw, that trajectory was pretty rapid towards bad outcome. Um, and you want to be able to intervene confidently and, and be right in, in your intervention. And so I asked earlier, you know, what, what do a police officer and a physician have in common? And what I really should have been asking is, you know, what do, say, like a, a SWAT team or, you know, SEAL Team 6 have in common with these doctors here who are, you know, working in a sort of critical uh, setting? Um, you know, we do see... Uh, uh, police and firefighters and the military and doctors on television sort of depicted in these, um, you know, with, with, with in heroic terms, with a lot of drama where the protagonist um, kind of saves the day under pressure and everything is seamless and works out, works out great. I wish that were the reality in every case, but it's, it's unfortunately not, and it's really not that easy. Um, cases are sort of replete with, you know, with, with failures and challenges and imperfections. Um, we rely really a lot more on our colleagues and luck and a lot of times prayer. Um, and fortunately, the human body is actually quite resilient and will just pull through despite us. Um, but let's say that we actually want to um, get at, you know, what does it take to be that physician that you kind of see on television um, who does save the day. Um, so really, um, this framework begins with a simple branch point. It starts with the question of us ask, asking, is the patient sick or not sick? Um, and you'll, you'll hear doctors talk about this, especially in training. I'll, I'll ask residents when they're presenting a patient to me, I'll say, is the patient sick or not sick? And, and this is not to say, you know, I, I have a patient in the department who has no illness. It's to say, by sick, I mean, are they crashing? Are they critically ill? Is something really bad about to happen if I don't do something right now? Versus not sick. They have an illness, but I can spend a little bit of time. I can um, think through. I can apply some analytic reasoning. And I, have, I have some time. Well, when the patient is actually sick, and our ability to recognize them as, as sick, um, we sort of enter a alternate pathway. What I was explaining before about heuristics and analytic reasoning are still relevant, but less so. Um, you know, we, we go into this, um, this slightly different, almost less active form of, of cognitive analytic reasoning. Um, and really what we're doing is rather than thinking, we're, we're intervening. We are actually doing things in real time based on the information that we're, that we're presented with. Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail to make it a little bit more clear. 
Um, and there's been a lot that's been written on, on this type of work, whether it be in, in healthcare or in the military or other professions. Um, and, you know, there's so many different sort of academic features that people talk about, you know, what, it, what makes a, um, what will make someone good under pressure. I'm just going to talk about four things that I think are particularly relevant, particularly in for, in, important. Um, I think you want the, your, your physician in these scenarios to be, to be calm, but you want them to have sort of the optimal amount of arousal and excitement as well. You don't want someone who's really mellow, but you do want them to be calm. You want them to be able to tune out noise. Um, and then sort of along the lines with that, you want them to have really honed, really good perceptive skills. Um, and then you want them to be able to make rapid decisions. So we'll go through each, each one of these four in a little bit more detail. Um, so this is what I was talking about when I said you, you want your um, physician to be calm, but not too calm. Um, this is the um, level of arousal theory. It's been kind of worked out. Um, and it turns out that your performance is directly a function of your level of arousal. When you're asleep, you are not performing very well. Um, and really, you know, when you're bored and kind of alert, um, you start seeing a little bit better performance. And at the peak of this curve is sort of the optimal point that you want your physician or anyone who works under pressure to be. When you go off the deep end, when you sort of go beyond that level of arousal, you end up in kind of with a physician or a firefighter or a police officer who's stressed. Now the performance goes down. You can go beyond that to anxiety and then an even sheer panic, in which case you're basically a, might as well be asleep. Um, now, over time, there's probably a little bit of a, of a dampening effect. Um, you know, when you start in medical training, um, even the, the most sort of simple clinical scenarios will result in sheer panic right off the bat. Um, <laughs> And over time, what ends up happening is, you know, that panic turns into anxiety, turns into a little bit of stress, and then you kind of hit that sweet spot of, hey, you know, I kind of know what I'm doing. I've got all my senses. And when I say, you know, kind of level of arousal, this is not just, you know, cognitive in my brain, what's going through my mind, but it has to actually do with, you know, my heart rate, my sort of autonomic nervous system, my blood pressure. These things actually have to be at that same level of arousal as well. You know, uh, I need to sweat just a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit to actually make me feel like I'm um, really in the moment and I'll probably perform a little bit better. Now, unfortunately, like I said, that dampening effect can continue and you'll find physicians who find themselves incredibly bored in the, some of the most critical scenarios. Maybe they're just really good clinicians and the job has just gotten really easy for them. Maybe they're burnt out and they don't really care as much, but that is a consideration. It's something that you sort of have to be, to be worried about, that this, this curve can um, shift depending on the clinical scenario. Um, so I thought about um, the next parts of you know, what it takes to be a really good um, physician under pressure. And I thought, well, you know, you have to talk a little bit about what it's like to, to be able to tune out noise and to be really, really perceptive. And I, I kind of racked my brain about how do, you, how do you represent that? How do I, what do I put on the screen as pretty as this to sort of, sort of exemplify that? Um, and then actually I was on shift this morning and I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna videotape, um, you know, what's going on in one of the rooms and just play it for you. Um, so I'll give you the disclaimer that this is, um, Everyone involved uh, was, was uh, consented to this, this video being taken, um, and that it is a real scenario with a critically ill patient. So, you know, you know just be, be aware of that. Um, so I'll go ahead and play it, um, and then I'll make some comments about it. Yeah, uh, two pounds of that. Yeah, 
So lots happen in there. Um, it hopefully shouldn't make any sense because there's just a lot of a lot of noise. Um, now I'm actually standing kind of right at the base of this, you know, of the screen. If you could I'm come down there at the bottom, um, and I'm kind of standing back, um, just kind of taking in everything. Um, for me, it's it's actually interesting. I, I can't really put my finger on what it is, but it's all about sort of standing back and just observing. And over time, after enough practice, what ends up happening is the salient features just kind of come to you, and all the noise goes away. Um, you know, I heard all the important things that I needed to hear from the paramedic and was listening to what the nurses were doing without hearing all the extraneous um, stuff. It's just you, you, after enough training and practice, this is what your mind um, immediately does. And this actually really gets to the, the importance of simulation in medical education because, you know, this is not something you want to learn on the job. It's something that you want to have practiced. Um, you want to have tested out your sort of level of arousal curve in a controlled environment so that when this happens, you are actually calm and actually can, can sort of tune out um, that noise. Um, now I'm going to show you the next part of, of this video. I'm sort of jump, a, jump ahead a little bit, and um, I'll talk about it afterwards. I'll pause it there. Um, uh, I, I mean, I don't know if you guys even recognize me. I'm, I'm right, I'm right there. Um, but I, I sort of uh, came into the frame there um, after I'd taken a little bit of information, and I, and I, I immediately went to put my hand on the patient's pulse, and I was kind of peering through to try and find my way to see the. the um, the cardiac monitor. And actually, um, you might have heard the voice of um, Dr. Durant, who's one of the residents who was working with me, and he was doing the exact same thing. In fact, he was calling out specifically what he was seeing on the monitor, and he had his hand on the opposite, opposite pulse. Um, and really what was happening in this, in this um, scene is rather than paying attention to everything that's going on around me, I had kind of taken in all I was going to get from when the patient arrived, and I spent the rest of the, the the rest of the time during this video, seeking out information specifically that I wanted. Um, and it's not to say that this is like an incredibly perceptive skill of, uh, of mine, but it was just sort of an active way to go perceive additional information um, that I felt was, was really important. Um, and actually, again, a lot of chaos, most, no, most of that probably didn't make any sense, but in that you know, few second clip right there, we actually had placed a breathing tube for the patient, prepared to shock them, administered critical medications, and those was all happening through sort of um, Dr. Durant was just very gently and, and pointedly um, directing the, the nursing staff and the other members of the team to, to do those, those critical actions. Um, he didn't hesitate. He knew exactly what he wanted to have done. Um, he had all the information that he needed to, to make those decisions. So. Um, so that's um, kind of this um, idea of, we'll go back to this idea of, of heuristics versus analytic reasoning. And, and what we're going to say is that um, in, in this type of scenario, it's almost like heuristics plus. It's this sort of rapid um, recognition primed decisions, which is what allows us to, to, to do what needs to be done. Um, and um, so let's talk about what recognition primed decisions are. You have an evolving um, critical scenario that's, that's happening in, in front of you. Um, and, and let me preface all this by saying that this, has been, this concept has been studied in not just critical care medicine, but it's been um, you know, battlefield um, preparation and uh, military training. Um, in fact, it's been applied to tournament chess matches. Um, this is kind of a, an interesting um, approach. Um, 
So when you think that there's not enough time to weigh all of the options or to test each hypothesis one at a time, um, you kind of start engaging in this unique decision making. Um, the first step in this um, scenario is to say, you know, is this um, situation familiar? Um, if it is not familiar, I'm going to seek more information. I'm going to go back to that scenario and I'm going to um, try and amass more information and ask myself, is it now familiar? And I'm going to keep doing this until I find something about that critical scenario, some, some important sort of signal through all that noise that I can hang my hat on and I can focus in on. So then I'm going to start, once it is familiar to me, I'm going to do four tasks. First, I'm going to set reasonable expectations. I'm going to size up the situation, and I'm going to say, what can I really accomplish here? Right? And might be some, asking something as simple as, will I be able to save this patient? Will this patient have a good outcome? What do I expect to happen at the end of what I'm about to embark on? Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of um, I kind of align all my uh, data inputs. Um, I'm going to you know, hook the patient up to the monitor so that I can kind of keep track of the cardiac rhythm. I'm going to put my hand on the pulse so that I can know whether or not there's a pulse with every heartbeat. And those are, I'm going to sort of pick the few pieces of, of data input that are of most critical importance to me so that I can use those to, um, to kind of guide where I'm, where I'm going. And then I'm going to, based on those inputs, I'm going to establish benchmarks um, for assessing if I actually understand the situation properly. So if I have a, a reasonable expectation that I have a patient who is in, let's say, um, hemorrhagic shock because they're bleeding from a gunshot wound to their abdomen, I'm going to have a reasonable expectation that if I pour blood into their, into their veins that their blood pressure will, will come back up. Right? So if that fails to happen, I may have misunderstood the situation. I may have to kind of go back and get more information. Um, and then I'm going to sort of identify sort of common or typical reasonably good actions or interventions. They're not going to be the best options because I don't really know what's going on with the patient. If I had the time and knew the absolute truth, well then yeah, I would do the best option, but I don't know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for the what I have available to me. What's the, what, what do I have right here, right now, that I could apply at this moment that, that may or may not have an effect? And I'm going to do this rather than think about doing it. I'm going to do it, and then I'm, if it works, great. If it doesn't, I'm going to try something else. And so it's a rapid sort of sequential intervention approach to um, managing critically, critically ill, Ill patients. Um, you know, the, the example um, um, for that is, you know, the, the patient doesn't have a pulse. And I look up on the monitor and they have a, a very particular type of electrical, electrical rhythm. You know, there is a laundry list of conditions that can cause that. I'm not going to test for them. I'm not going to start, um, you know, considering the probability of one versus the other. What I'm going to do is I'm going to administer epinephrine or adrenaline. I'm going to administer some electrolytes like calcium chloride and sodium bicarbonate. Um, I'm going to potentially put a, uh, a needle in through their chest and drain out trapped air that might have collapsed their lung. I might try to see if there's fluid around their heart and try and drain that. I might administer um, powerful clot-busting medications um, to try and break up a clot that may have caused, caused this. I don't know if any of these things are true, but I'm going to do them in, in rapid succession because I kind of don't have the luxury of, of evaluating for them individually one at a time. And on an even more primitive level, you know, we actually have algorithms um, for these exact types of scenarios. And they, they basically tell us to do exactly this. Uh, they, they formalize the, the um, framework of saying, you know, establish the appropriate data that you need to know what's going on with the situation. Um, these are the benchmarks that, you know, you're hopefully going to, to see happen when you do these things. And here are the list of things you should do in this particular order, in this cl particular clinical scenario. The, mo the most simple version of this is any critically ill patient that comes in, 
gets evaluated in the same exact way, regardless of what their condition is. They first get their, uh, we call it the ABCDE of medicine, the airway, the breathing, the circulation, the sort of disability or um, neurologic examination, and then their exposure, you get them fully exposed. Every patient, doesn't matter if you were um, shot in the chest or if you have you know, septic shock, you're gonna get the ABCDs um, in, in, those, in those scenarios. So to kind of summarize the second part, you know, we are hoping that we, you, 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 in these critical scenarios, you have a doctor who has the optimal level of arousal that they're able to tune out all of the, the noise around them, um, that they're able to hone in on very sort of specific perceptive um, skills that, that lead to success. And then they apply this very nuanced, interesting heuristic approach to sort of rapid um, decision making. Um, and so now I'm just gonna summarize the whole thing. We're gonna be done a little bit early. So what have we learned? Physicians possess no magical diagnostic skills, okay? Diagnosis is a, is a skill and an art. It's learned, practiced, and refined, okay? Um, physicians are gonna use intuition a lot more than people think, um, and they're gonna couple them with analytic skills, and they're gonna kind of use these in conjunction with a lot of probability theory to kind of hone in on diagnoses. Um, physicians are pretty well versed and relatively comfortable with uncertainty. And in the most critical of scenarios, we kind of perform more like trained military or professional athletes than anything else, really. And with that, I'm happy to take any of your questions. This is my email address if anyone has any particular questions and wants to email me directly. Yes? The question is basically when you use heuristics to make a decision, um, and you're and you're wrong, you know, how, how does that come back to bite you? And it comes back to bite you all the time. Um, you know, I you, you make these judgments, you you I, I think where you get into most of the trouble is when you extrapolate a little bit. You kind of say this mostly fits what I know, but you kind of ignore one or like half a piece of information that doesn't quite fit. And when you sort of say, ah, I'm gonna explain that little part away because everything else fits so nice and neat, it does come back to, to bite you. And the, 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 the worst thing you can hear when you come onto a shift in the ER is, hey, remember that guy you saw three days ago? Because it's always followed with, so. Yes, the reason for the compression fractures in that 10-year-old boy, um, he had leukemia that had infiltrated all the way through his bone marrow and weakened his bone, and just the most minimal of trauma had, had compressed those fractures. Sorry, I should have made that more clear. Yes. Did the patient this morning survive? Um, the answer is yes. The question is, um, will he have a uh, good neurologic outcome? And the question, that the answer to that is, is still uncertain. But um, he was in a better condition than when he arrived. Yes. The question was whether that was an automatic machine doing the CPR. Yeah, it's called a Lucas device, and it has completely transformed the way we do CPR. Um, it was actually interesting. It was used to be that we would, um, you know, in these scenarios, critically, the sickest patient in your emergency department needing CPR, and we, you would have the most junior person, the, the medical student or like the volunteer, do chest compressions, when in reality, that's probably the most important thing you could possibly be doing for the patient. And we gave it to the, the most junior person. Um, and uh, the, the Lucas device has completely transformed it because it gives the appropriate rate um, the appropriate depth, um, it can be turned on and off um, easily, it doesn't get tired, um, the paramedics have it, um, so they can do it in transport, so they're not in an ambulance rig bouncing around trying to do good CPR, um, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful device. Is that L-U-C-A-S? L-U-C-A-S, Lucas device, yes. The question is what, to, to relay uh, a story where I have sort of assumed horses and, and turns out to be zebras, is that right? Um, the only reason I'm having trouble coming up with an example is because it happens so often okay. that my mind is going blank. Um, um, I'll, I'll tell you a story of, of my nephew, actually. Um, when I was an intern, my nephew, um, lived in, they lived in Southern California at the time. Um, had a, a sore throat, 
Um, and so he went to his pediatrician after like three days of a sore throat, and they said, sore throat, it's not a big deal. Um, and a few days later, he ended up having, um, started having like a little bit of headaches. And sore throat had mostly gone away, but now he had like headaches with a little bit of fever. And he went back to the doctor and he thought, hmm, I don't know, it's a little bit weird, but um, kind of like the pediatrician in the previous thing, like we see this sometimes. Um, and uh, kind of said, keep an eye on it, see how, how things go. Um, and then a few more days went by, and, and now he was um, complaining of like really high fevers and really bad headaches. And he went to the ER, and the doctors there thought, well, you know, fever and headaches in a child who recently had a you know, sore throat illness, like this could be meningitis. And they did a CT scan and a spinal tap, and they were all normal. And they thought, well, we ruled it all out. Everything's normal. You get to go home. And, and then a few days later, he developed um, sort of neck pain and stiffness. Um, and they went back to uh, the ER and they couldn't figure out what it was. And, and uh, finally, it was like the fifth visit. They said, you know, we don't really know. Um, they sort of applied like, well, it's a sore throat, it's a sore throat. It's a headache and a fever, it's meningitis. And they, they thought, well, you know, let's test for all the common things that we have seen recently. I mean, I, I think the, the ER doctor once when I talked to him on the phone said, you know, I just saw a case of, of um, mono. Maybe this could be mono and, you know, a validator for that. When everything came back negative, the doctors finally said, we don't really know. We're going to admit him. And he got admitted and um, he ended up with uh, pneumonia. And the doctor said, well, you know, that explains it all. He's got pneumonia. That explains the whole constellation of symptoms. Um, and it's funny because everyone along the way sort of applied their sort of reasonable intuition as to what was going on. Um, and only when you zoom all the way out and you take the whole trajectory and you kind of almost like put it up on a slide for people, it turns out it's Lemire's disease, which is incredibly rare. It's kind of on the comeback. Um, but it was described in like 1900 by Andre Lemire, and it starts with. I mean, if you if you look up the text of it, it's this is classic. It's a classic zebra. It was a perfect presentation of sore throat followed by neck pain followed by uh, a pneumonia. And it, what happens is the the um, bug in the throat migrates out, sets up shop around the blood vessels in the neck, infects, forms a clot that's infected in the in the neck, that which then dislodges, goes to the lung and causes a, causes a pneumonia. He's totally fine. He made a full, full, full recovery. But um, it's just funny because it's a total zebra. It was a perfect presentation of the zebra. And every doctor missed it until you know, one doctor finally said, no, 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 this doesn't add up, and figured it out. Yes? Yeah, so the question is whether or not technology will kind of supplant um, doctors' intuition and skills and you know, apply apply probability theory even more faithfully? Um, the answer is um, hopefully not. Um, I think what has happened is, um, fortunately, no two patients are alike. It's not like we're talking about um, a very simple closed system where every individual patient that comes through is so similar that I can apply the same rules to that patient. Um, so in that sense, I'll hopefully always have a job. Um, but the, there's two answers to that. One is, I think what, what is coming down the pike is these ideas of like clinical decision rules, where it's like mathematically derived formulas to predict probabilities, and then actually give you sort of a decision tree of options, and tell you kind of where you end up with each one of those decisions. Um, and that has come into clinical practice um, with you know, in the last you know few decades, um, and you know we apply it all the time. Um, so I think that is the first step. Um, the the second answer is well, yeah, it might be because I actually found an article about the same IBM computer, Watson, that won at Jeopardy, is now being used for like coming up with differential um, diagnoses. For the time being, I think that um, you know I don't think that it's going to supplant um, the medical decision making, and I think patients still want to have a doctor at the bedside. So um, yeah. The question is, and why in CPR we no longer do mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing? Um, and the answer is um, actually partially related to the, to the Lucas device. So um, it turns out that um, in order, it turns out that breathing for someone, actually pumping you know, oxygen into their mouth, doesn't do a whole lot. 
Um, I mean, you don't breathe 100% oxygen, so it's not like you're providing someone with, with tremendous amounts of oxygen, so it doesn't really help. What does help is to you know, have continual blood flow. Um, and if you want any reasonable chance of that heart who, that has now stopped to remain alive, you need to actually have not the heart being squeezed so that blood flows to the body and the brain, but you actually need the blood to be flowing through the blood vessels of the heart itself. Um, and they did these wonderful studies where they showed that when you do chest compressions, the first 10, 15, 20 chest compressions you do really don't sort of perfuse that blood to that heart muscle very well. Um, it's actually after the 20th one, with every chest compression, the pressure rises a little higher, a little higher, a little higher, and then you get to this kind of steady state, which actually is perfusing to the heart and may preserve the heart. And every time you stop, even for a couple of seconds, to do you know, a breath, that pressure drops off. And then when you start chest compressions, you have to build all the way back up. So the idea is now you want no breaks in the chest compressions. And that's one of the beauties of the Lucas devices because it can just keep going perfectly and, and not stop. And once you get to that pressure, you just sort of keep it up. Yes? Yeah, the, the question is whether or not, um, you know, if, if stressed too much, doctors will, will rely too much on heuristics to make decisions. And the answer is yes. Um, I think that, um, Every once in a while, you know, if I've worked, say, four, five, six days in a row and I'm really tired, it's very tiring to use analytic reasoning. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of fall back a little bit on my heuristics. And I have to, I have to actually catch myself and say, no, I need, I need to clear my head. I need to actually go through, through this algorithm. Um, the specific clinical scenario that you're describing is a perfect one. I mean, we have this kind of rule of thumb in our mind that every patient with sepsis needs a lot, a lot, a lot of fluids. And the nuanced answer to that is, well, yeah, they need a lot of fluids, but there are ways of deciding how much fluids is too much. And if I just sort of say, well, it's a good rule of thumb to just give them a lot of fluid and ask questions later, I could get into trouble. Um, versus if I stop and say, I need to really apply some reasoning and some diagnostic tests to figure out when to stop and when to try other therapies. Um, definitely get better outcomes. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, um, like in, in battlefield combat, when, when you want to improve survival out there, there's sort of, you deploy a, a set of interventions kind of on block to, to intervene, um, and whether or not we, we sort of do that in, in clinical practice. The answer is yes. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about um, bundles now, you know, the sepsis bundle. When someone has severe septic shock, we unleash a bundle of therapies upon them. Um, in this scenario, yes, there's the ACLS algorithm that you run, which dictates which medications to give, when to shock, what to do. Um, and, you know, you sort of add on to that, well, you know, the patient is unconscious and I need to take control of their breathing. So let's, you know, and you sort of do these things simultaneously. And what it ultimately amounts to is, yes, we sort of deploy them all simultaneously. Um, maybe sometimes informally, we just kind of know that all these things need to be done. And then sometimes more formally in the form of like bundles for specific conditions. Yeah. Yes. Right. So the question is, um, if for those who've seen the waiting room, you kind of see us really interesting perspective on medicine and what are some of the additional challenges that you face working in you know, what we call county hospitals, um, county hospitals throughout the country. Um, I think that uh, there's so many challenges, but there's also so many rewards in, in working in those, in those scenarios. Some of them are the rewards of sort of being altruistic and serving a community that maybe needs it more. Some of them are actually um, kind of selfish. There's, a, there's a sort of this badge of honor to say, you know, I work at county. Um, it gets you out of speeding tickets, for sure. Um, so that's one of the, one of the perks. Um, but what are the challenges? Um, so you know, we do a lot of primary care. Um, I'm actually pretty good at managing high blood pressure, even though it's not an actual formal part of you know, um, um, ER training. Um, I, I think one of the other challenges is seeing the same patients every single day. Um, we know them all by a first name basis. We see them out and about in the community. Um, we, you know, we in some ways become their family. Um, they know us by first name and, you know, inevitably they're, we call them frequent flyers. 
Um, inevitably, you know, they all get really sick and they all die. And when they do, it's really sad for us. Um, so I think part of the challenges is, is working in, and I mean, this is just one example of, of working with a population that um, maybe doesn't take very good care of themselves, relies on you a lot. Um, and it's, it's kind of like um, caring for a very um, burdensome, estranged family member. Yes. So the decision to, to admit someone to the hospital versus discharge them home. Um, so this, I mean, this is like a whole nother level of decision making. Um, well, I think it depends on what, whether or not there is a condition present that I've identified that requires something, some intervention that needs to be provided. You know, ideally in the emergency department, someone is going to be there for a few hours and I'm going to make a diagnosis or not, or, you know, intervene and, um, make a decision as to whether or not they need to be in the hospital or, or go, or they can go home. You generally don't try and keep someone in the ER for days at a time and continue to work on them. You know, you sort of pass them off to the appropriate specialist. So for me, it, it really depends on does that patient have something that they need as an inpatient? Do they need a specific medication that they can only get through their IV that I can't give to them at home? Um, do they need to have an operation? Um, do they, are they so high risk is, is what brought them to the ER so concerning to me that I just want to watch them really closely so that if something bad happens, they're in front of me as opposed to, not in front of me, but in front of you know, a nurse or a physician or someone else so that they don't go home and have a bad outcome at, at home. Those are some of the considerations. Um, for me personally, my style of practice is, is really kind of shared decision making. So I will present the facts to the patient to the best of my ability and I'll ask them what they want to do. Um, and, you know, if I really feel like they're fine, they can go home, I send them home. But, you know, if, if I'm kind of on the fence, I let the patients kind of weigh in on that decision as well. Everyone kind of comes in. I, I like to say, you know, I, I trained at Highland, and um, I, I think of the training as almost like this machine. And it, it, it takes, sucks everyone in, and everyone's at different levels when they come in, and it kind of spits everybody out kind of on par with one another. And um, so in some instances, some medical students will graduate medical school, they'll come to residency, they'll be an intern, and they'll have an incredible fund of knowledge, but have just, you know, not an ounce of kind of reasoning or judgment. Um, and that's really challenging. And it's particularly challenging when, when they don't have insight into the fact that they don't have very good, because the, the, the resident says, you know, like, oh, I knew, you know, the, the biochemical pathway, but, just didn't catch the fact that the patient, you know, had X, Y, or Z. Um, that's easier. You can kind of coach them through that. But when they're oblivious to the fact that they're that they're missing things, that's that's the the biggest um, the biggest challenge. Um, there are definitely some who come who go straight to the sheer panic side, and it takes a lot of coaching and support. There are some who come in with a false sense of security. Again, a little bit more dangerous. Who think, well, I kind of know how. How this is going to go, and inevitably they will have, you know, within the first few months of residency, they'll have one or two really humbling experiences, and then the paradigm shifts. They kind of resets, and that's what I'm saying. The machine takes care of it all. They kind of spits them all out, really kind of well tuned for their for their um, profession. Yes. So the question is, if there's a protection, you know, specifically for ER doctors against lawsuits, since we kind of work in a high risk um, environment. Um, the answer is no. Um, no. <laughs> that's, just, that's just really it. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very high risk um, environment to work. You work with a lot of uncertainty. You have to make a lot of rapid decisions and, you know, bad things can happen. Um, I won't say anything more because I am very superstitious and I don't want to make any statements <laughs> about this. So I'm going to knock here. <laughs> The question is whether or not you can have more than one diagnosis and how that affects your, your decision making. And um, yeah, I think that it, it stumps us. We, we always strive to find one di unifying diagnosis for everything. That's kind of like the, the holy grail. But the, a lot of times patients will have more than one, one diagnosis. One of them may be very, very easy. One of them may require a lot of analytic reasoning. Um, so yeah, I think it... it um, you apply the same principles, maybe kind of 
individually for, for those things. And when, when those two conditions are in some ways uh, related, um, you know, you, maybe you kind of anchor in on one and miss the other. Um, or maybe you pick up on one and it leads you to the other. Um, there is definitely a lot of interplay between them. Yes. Right. So the, the paradigm for, for work hours for ER doctors. Um, in training, you can't work more than um, 12 hours in a row. And I think you have to have as many hours off as you have worked. And there's like a maximum of 60 hours per week or something along those lines. Um, once you're done with residency, there are no limits. Um, um, I say that knowing that firsthand. Um, you know, there are places you can go work where they'll let you work 24 hours in a row. Um, you know, those places aren't busy all the time. They can get busy, but usually you can find some time to, to go and sleep. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of literature on it. There's a lot of literature on the kind of like the, the flip-flopping of day-night schedules. That's probably an even more um, charged issue that people talk about a lot in terms of how that affects your ability to make good, rational, reasoned decision making. Like I was saying earlier, after a stretch of three or four days in a row, I really need a day off because it's an intense job. I, a lot of times I don't sit for eight hours and you know, you're thinking, 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 thinking. Um, it can get really tiring and you kind of mind just starts to falter a little bit. Yes, so how did I decide to become an ER doctor? Um, well, I've always kind of had this interest in public health and um, in my mind, the ER kind of is the, the face of a public health institution. Um, but the, I think the real reason was when I, you, you sort of, as a third year medical student, rotate through all these different rotations. And with every single one, my favorite part was when they called from the ER about a new patient. Because I got to go down there and get this like fresh patient with you know, no diagnosis made. It's kind of like a blank slate of a patient. Um, and you get to apply a lot of this type of reasoning and, and skill. Um, and, and I say, you know, like when I admit a patient to um, the hospital and I call the specialist and I say, I have a patient with pneumonia, you know, there's, well, I could be wrong, um, but generally speaking, I've already done a lot of the diagnostic work and they then pick up from there and go. Um, I certainly admit patients where I don't know what the diagnosis is and, and it gets made a, as an inpatient or by somebody else, but for the most part, it's the, one of the last few places where you are a diagnostician. Um, really the only other place I can think of is maybe radiology because you actually look inside people with x-rays and, and make diagnoses. But. So the question is, if, you, if a patient goes to their primary doctor or an office-based physician, and then that physician says, I need to send you to the hospital, sometimes they'll get, you know, so get directly admitted to a, a ward bed where a hospitalist will take care of them versus they'll say, go to the ER. Um, the answer is, the, it's a lot of times easier to send someone to an ER. Um, so there's that caveat. But generally speaking, I mean, the, the algorithm should basically be, if, if I know that my patient, if I'm an office space physician and I know that my patient has, um, let's say, heart failure, and their heart failure has gotten really bad in the last few weeks or you know, whatever it may be, and I know exactly what therapy they need, I may admit them to the hospital, have them admitted to the hospital for a very specific therapy. Um, the flip side is, if, I, if that patient says, I have um, chest pain, and I don't know what the cause of that chest pain is, I may say, I need you to go to the ER because I need some diagnostic tests to be done. And it's a much more rapid place where you can have diagnostic tests done rather than being admitted to a hospital. Um, so I think when the patient still has some uncertainty, it's kind of that blank slate I was talking about, they're more likely to end up in the ER versus if there's a very specific course of therapy that's indicated, they might get admitted um, directly to the, to the hospital. The, the question is really basically about uh, kind of partitioning out care to different um, different providers. That's a that's a very different that's a, that's a very interesting topic that requires a whole lot more. And I actually, I don't have enough nuanced understanding of where we're headed in medicine with this, this hospitalist based practice. I mean, it, it used to be that you know a primary doctor would admit the patient primarily to the hospital. Then hospitalists began admitting patients and doing a better job at it because they were 
really hospitalists. And then, you know, now you're even seeing surgeons moving towards being hospitalists. And the question is, do those people do the same type of stuff? And the answer is yes, absolutely. This is not, by, by no means is what I'm talking about, a, an ER specific thing. I think part of the reason that it's fun to talk about it in from the ER context is because there's just so much variety and, and kind of maybe just more fun stories at uh, ER. So, yes. Do ER physicians call in um, specialists? All the time. Um, and that's, you know, by no means do we, yeah, by no means do we practice on, in an island. Um, we rely on our specialists constantly, um, whether that be to do a specific procedure that we can't do, um, or whether that be to you know weigh in on something. Sometimes I'll call and ask for advice. Sometimes I'll call and have them review some specific information. Sometimes I'll call and ask them to come see the patient and give me some recommendations. And sometimes I'll ask them to just admit the patient and take them outright and deal with them. All right, so if there's no more questions, we'll wrap up. Thanks, everybody.